Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to our seminar today. Uh, 40 years since the Falkland and Malvinas War. On this occasion, we have a group of distinguished international guests, starting with Professor Sir Lauren Friedman, official historian of the Falkland War for the United Kingdom, and distinguished professor of King College and world renowned strategist. And also, uh, Professor Juan Bataleme, director of the Argentinian Council for International Relations, CARI, and retired Admiral Matias Porcel, professor of the strategy chair of the Chilean Navy War Academy. The modality will be the following. Each guest will present his main ideas uh, in a frame time in the same order of this presentation. And then we will conclude with the Q&A uh, session. Without further ado, it is my honor to thank you, our illustrious guest, presenting to, to you, Sir Lauren Friedman, Professor Emeritus at King College, an international renowned author of numerous world famous books, such as Strategy, which is a seminal piece master here, and, and also The Future of War, one interesting book, and Ukraine and the Art of Strategy, too. Professor Friedman will refer to the British view of the conflict and the main political and defense implication for the UK. Sir, it is our honor to have you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a real honor for me to be with you and to be with such a, an excellent panel. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they're going to say. You've asked me to talk about um, the, the, the broad defense and political implications for the UK. And I thought I'd start with the, with the counterfactual, which is what would have happened if Britain had not been able to send a task force and if, um, have, or having sent a task force, if it had been defeated, because that was uh, certainly a possibility. So let me, let me start with um, what would have happened if Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had followed the first advice she had been given um, on the 31st of March when the UK got its first intelligence that an Argentine um, invasion of the Falklands might be imminent. Uh, and my first advice was there's not a lot we could do, not much more than uh, economic, trying to organize economic sanctions against uh, Buenos Aires, but really uh, our military position, certainly in defending the islands, which was evident was, was hopeless, but even in sending a task force. That was changed when the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Henry Leach, came into the meeting, he hadn't been invited, but he invited himself, uh, and demonstrated that a task force could be sent, and if it was sent, it had to take everything that it could in order um, to uh, be able to cope with all eventualities. If he hadn't given that advice, probably Margaret Thatcher would have fallen. Probably British political history thereafter would have been completely different. It wouldn't have been uh, necessarily a general election, but she wasn't particularly popular at that time in her own party and would have been replaced by a more um, moderate figure. Um, and the blame would have been attached to the uh, previous year's defence review, the 1981 defence review, um, which, if it had been fully implemented uh, by the time uh, Argentina took the islands, uh, the UK would not have been able to respond, not least because one of the aircraft carriers, uh, HMS Illustrious, was due to be uh, sold off to the Australians. And there were issues about uh, capacities for amphibious warfare as well. Uh, also important in that review had been the decision uh, to uh, get rid of HMS Endurance, the ice patrol ship, which wasn't in the South Atlantic very often, uh, no more than four months a year, but was the major statement of, of the UK commitment uh, to the defence uh, of, of the islands, along with um, a platoon of Royal Marines. So it would have been clear that she was to blame uh, for, for the defence review, uh, 
uh, and for pay not paying enough attention <coughs> to uh, the, the developing uh, conflict with Argentina uh, over the previous uh, two years. There had been a move um, in 1980 uh, to try to uh, find a deal, uh, so-called lease-back deal. Uh, it was never as solid uh, as was supposed to or perhaps hearing what it meant in Argentina. Uh, but anyway, it, it didn't survive either islander or parliamentary scrutiny in the UK. And after that, all the UK could do was procrastinate. It didn't really have a diplomatic strategy. Uh, there was an inquiry after the war as to why this had been allowed to happen, the, the Franks inquiry, uh, which I think put a rather um, friendly construction uh, on, on, on what was still a, 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 an intelligent failure, but basically a policy failure to appreciate how the conflict was developing. So that, I think, is what would have happened um, if there had been uh, no action. Uh, even worse for the government, possibly, would have been action that failed. Uh, again, I think one would have been looking at the carriers. There were a number of attempts to take out uh, HMS Illustrious or HMS Hermes, the two carriers. Um, but there were a number of things uh, that might have been done uh, that would have made it much more difficult for the British to, to land, um, uh, uh, to retake the island. Uh, again, we, we can discuss later what they might have been. The, the, the key thing is if they had happened, then this would have, I think in most people's eyes, confirmed a period of British uh, political and military decline. After all, the, the last major British operation anybody could remember in 1982 was Suez in 1956, when with the French, the British uh, and the Israelis, the, Brit the British um, had tried to end um, uh, Nasser's uh, control of the Suez Canal in, in Egypt. And the whole thing had ended rather farcically when the United States expressed its opposition and the British had to withdraw. And though there'd been uh, other things since then in, in Malaysia, in, in, in Northern Ireland, no major operation had really been attempted. And there was a lot of scepticism, even in 1982, that the British could pull it off. If they hadn't pulled it off, then I think it would have confirmed um, uh, a, sense, a sense of British decline. Uh, as it was, it had the opposite effect to both of these possibilities. It, it, it uh, gave uh, Prime Minister Thatcher uh, a reputation as a fearless war leader. Uh, she won the uh, 1983 election handsomely, uh, partly as a result of the war. Uh, and there was a sort of renewed confidence uh, in the UK political and military establishment as a result of the victory. Uh, I think it, it's imp imp important to note that prior to um, the war, uh, it would be hard to say that, that this was a major political issue in the UK, unlike Argentina. Uh, most people would have struggled to point out where the Falklands were on the map, uh, or even if they'd heard about it, uh, heard about the islands. Uh, let alone the dispute. Um, what mattered in the UK debate um, was not that this was an important territory to hold, that it was a, uh, an important asset, but the way it had been taken in an embarrassing way um, and, uh, and uh, using force to resolve uh, a political dispute. It also helped in terms of maintaining British uh, uh, political cohesion, uh, so that the opposition, uh, the opposition parties joined the government in in uh, in supporting the task force, was that at the time Argentina was run by a right wing dictatorship. If it had been a left wing dictatorship, maybe it had been a different matter. But a right wing dictatorship uh, made it easier for the Labour Party to express its opposition. They couldn't uh, accept the possibility that people who identified as British should be in a way be handed over to that sort of, that sort of regime. But I think the important point was, uh, somebody put it to me that not long after, um, uh, this is true not only of the UK, but the UK's allies in 
in Europe and, and the US is, is it wasn't, uh, as somebody put it, that, that, that the Falklands was on the back burner. It wasn't even on the stove. It, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't an issue um, that captured a lot of attention. Thatcher had viewed it largely because a few backbenchers, MPs, uh, were very invested in, in the issue uh, and formed a lobby that, that argued against uh, any uh, concessions to Argentina on, on sovereignty. Uh, once the war was over, all that changed, of course. Lives had been lost, money had been spent, equipment um, uh, had been expended uh, to protect British sovereignty um, and to uh, spare the island. And um, so that having happened, despite what many assumed possibly in the aftermath, um, there was no political gain to be made by anybody in uh, arguing for uh, renewed negotiations on sovereignty. Negotiations on everything else were always going to be possible, but not on, on sovereignty. Uh, moreover, now um, the islands had got political attention. Um, they also got a new airfield. They got um, a garrison, which is still there. Uh, it's considered quite important now, not partly to defend the islands, but, but, but also for training purposes and so on. Um, uh, and they got a better economy. Um, so the, the, the islands who had been really in a, in a poor economic state before the, uh, before the invasion became viable. I mean, not, not the defense effort that was paid for by the UK, but the rest, um, but the, but the general civilian economy became viable and the population which had been in decline, it was always tiny, but it, it had been declining well under 2000 uh, people, um, so it grew again. Uh, uh, and again, not to, not to large numbers, uh, but sort of doubled from, from, from where it had been, well, you know, which leads, um, I think many observers to the thought that if Argentina had just waited, um, they would have got the islands eventually. Over time, they, they wouldn't have been viable um, and some sort of, um, deal would have been arranged, uh, best if it had not been demanded by Buenos Aires, but over time it, it just would not have been viable. Uh, but because of the war, they became viable, uh, which again is sort of a, a warning about uh, not trying, which Russia might take note of at the moment, about not trying to resolve all your disputes by military means. Um, I think the, uh, the the other side of of, of this that, that, that's worth uh, spending a little bit of time on is, is what um, what was learned about military operations and how this affected military thinking uh, as a result uh, of of the success of the operation. I think uh, a number of things uh, are important. Um, the first is that. Uh, by and large, uh, command and control worked quite well, particularly at the higher political end. Um, unlike Argentina, the, 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 well, as I understand it, the forces were in a sense each fighting their own war. Um, the, the effort was more integrated, uh, it was largely naval led, um, uh, and that worked quite well. The, value of a professional army uh, marines was shown. Um, my feeling, having looked a lot at reports of the battles and so on, is actually the difference was not particularly the Argentines, Argentines had uh, conscripts. Um, as far as I can tell, the conscripts fought pretty bravely and well. I don't think that was um, ever an issue, but they weren't well led. Um, and I think the, what was an advantage in the in the UK system was the um, was was the NCOs, the corporals and the sergeants, uh, who I think are, are essential to a professional army. But the, I mean the the, the 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 British soldiers that died were of a similar age to the Argentinian soldiers that died. They were all young, um, uh, and this was their first big battle as well. Uh, but, the, but they had been trained, and the British had trained for amphibious operations um, in Norway rather than 
the South Atlantic, but they had trained for operations like this. Um, critical to, to the British success was that they took their own air power with them. If they hadn't had the carriers, that wouldn't have been possible. And the Harriers um, outperformed uh, the Mirage and Skyhawks. Um, uh, there weren't quite enough of them, but just enough. The logistics issues were uh, extraordinary. And I think I would go along with those who would say possibly the main achievement of uh, Operation Corporate, as, the, as it was called, was, was the logistics. Uh, keeping those forces supplied over 8,000 miles, um, doing so um, uh, yeah, essentially with the advantage of, of the Ascension Island, that which I probably would have still have been difficult, but having to take ships up from trade, an enormous effort went into, went into logistics. Uh, and that in the end made it possible, although even then, um, the loss of the Atlantic conveyor um, uh, during the, uh, what would, at the time of the landing, uh, meant the loss of helicopters and, uh, and that added a great strain to the final, um, final uh, weeks of the war. Um, two final observations, one of, one of which struck me um, very much when I was doing my official history. The senior commanders uh, of, of the task force, including the Chief of Defence Staff, Lord Lewin, uh, were veterans of the Second World War. Uh, uh, Lewin had been in convoys during the Second World War. Um, and uh, he wasn't alone with having that sort of experience. The chief of the army, uh, uh, General Bramall, um, had been D-Day and so on. Um, it's also worth noting some of the two members of the war cabinet, um, Foreign Secretary Francis Pym, um, Deputy Prime Minister William Whitelaw, had both earned military crosses um, uh, during the Second World War. Um, and they brought to the higher level discussions an experience of warfare that they, in a sense, passed down to the next generation. Um, this was made clear to me when um, discussing with somebody who'd been present the reaction in the Ministry of Defence to the loss of HMS Sheffield, um, when Lewin found everybody gloomy, uh, unsurprisingly, and he said, and when asked, he was told why, because of um, an expensive ship had been lost, lives had been lost. And his answer was, if you're not prepared to lose escorts, there's no point in having them. Um, that is, um, uh, the realities of war uh, have to be understood and accepted. If you don't uh, understand the losses that war entail, you certainly have no business starting one or getting engaged in one. The, the final point um, to make is the difference that this made to the armed forces. Um, one of the consequences of um, the way that the task force was sent is that rather than the media representatives um, being the normal war correspondent, some war correspondents went with, with military experience, actually it was just whoever was available to the media, which meant that people who'd in a way grown up like I did um, in, in, the, uh, in the 1960s with all the attitudes of the 1960s towards, uh, prompted by Vietnam and so on, towards the military, which were not desperately positive, uh, suddenly found themselves uh, embarked on th this long trip um, uh, to the South Atlantic uh, and realized that a lot of the officers that they were talking to had actually quite similar backgrounds to, they, to them, had rather similar views of them, um, but were rather professionally going um, about their business, dealing with the war, embarking on a war, uh, having to show bravery. In many cases, people that became quite well known to the media were killed. Um, and that I think began a shift in attitudes so that rather than um, the sort of the conventional view of the military as being a reactionary institution led by sort of upper class idiots, uh, it was began to be appreciated as a serious professional outfit. And it led to a period in which really until things began to go wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
um, uh, in, earlier this decade or so ago, um, in which things went well. I mean, most operations the UK was involved in after that, they looked professional, they did well, they achieved their objectives. So it led to a, a, a much more positive attitude towards the military, towards the use of armed force, and to the expectations that in the end, we would probably win. Um, only I think, uh, mainly in, in Iraq, uh, did it become apparent that that isn't really always the case. And in, as I indicated earlier, it might not even have been the case uh, with the Falklands, but in the end it was. I think with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Friedman, for your presentation. And now I would like to introduce uh, Professor Juan Bataleme from the Argentinian Council for International Relations and Professor at the Argentinian Naval War College and the University of Buenos Aires, author of many books uh, related to security and defense, not only in the region, but also internationally. Um, Professor Badaleme uh, will refer to the subject, the Argentinian view of the conflict and its impact on national defense. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much uh, to Athena Lavit an honor for me to be able to be here with uh, Professor Matias Porcel, Admiral, and also professor of my equivalent in the Naval War College, and also together with Professor Lawrence Friedman. The reason why it was really great to share this, uh, this book, the strategy book, right? because uh, many of us about the Kindle version, so it's really interesting to see how large of a book it is. To look at this uh, volume of thought. Thank you, okay, have a great day, have a great morning. And this morning I'd like to express the first of all in uh, these events, right, and successes uh, and instances, allow us to be responsible and think about all of those who participated, both on the side of the Argentina Republic and the UK, Great Britain. In, uh, in the Falklands uh, war, okay. So I will be addressing this issue this morning. Okay, so 40 years after the conflict, the impact it had in matters of defense has been really important, but I think we have to bring two main backgrounds from the point of view of the Argentina Republic. First, the first component for this uh, view is the idea of change how the defense of the Argentinian Republic has had to adapt from the Falklands War and onwards until today, 2022, right? This international environment change where the Falklands War took place. If we were to look at this from a systemic point of view in a bipolar background in a war that shouldn't have happened in the first place, in this context, okay, in this bipolar context, the Argentinian defense had to be rethought to then start operating in a monopolar context. And now in a multipolar world, which is once again applying a pressure on territorial dynamics. This is the first uh, part. The second part, which also has to do with change, is the change at home. I mean, this was a war fought under our dictatorship, a peace that had to be built, and a defense that had to be built, uh, build a democratic transition. And how now, since we are a full democracy, just like the UK, we have to rethink our defense. Why am I saying this? because uh, the Falklands War closed what we could call two main traumas. First, the trauma of the war against the Persian, and second, this trauma of the Falklands War, this trauma, this wound, this political wounds forced change. There is a valid discussion on which of the two has had a greater impact in terms of uh, this trauma for the Latin Republic and the configuration, both in the legislative aspect and also the perceptions of defense. And what's true is that the Falklands War as a trauma also forced the lawmakers to think about the context in which defense had to arise facing the future. It, it also worth saying that the Falklands War has been fundamental to generate what we now know in the Latin Republic as a separation between security and defense, which is something established in our defense law from 1982, 88, sorry. And the 
Homeland Security Law of 1991. Now, lawmakers who thought these laws, right, because even when they establish specific areas, they always generated these uh, communication instances so Argentina could have in the best possible security and defense. The other point, which comes 10 years after and 16 years after the Falklands War, which is precisely about taking this uh, point addressed uh, by Professor Friedman very well, by the way, about the professionalization and modernization and what we could call the modernization of command and control for the Argentina Republic, which is the military modernization law, which actually makes it so reforms. So if we were to fight in a war once again, none of the three branches that fought in the war, the army, the navy, and the air force had to fight their own wars. So therefore it gives an emphasis, it gives a greater emphasis to the state as a whole, but it made a clear decision from the democracy point of view as opposed to what happened under the dictatorship, where it is an interesting uh, part about this uh, 1998 law about the defense resources, which unfortunately are never met, and now we will be explaining why that's the case. Now, the key for the key point is that it sets what we now know as the National Defense Fund or FONDEF as it's called, and it should allow for us to think or undertake the modernization of our uh, military forces in the Argentina Republic. So now these uh, three laws take me to my second point, which is about consensus. Basically, which political consensus was generated by the Falklands War, and as I said before, this uh, war against the subversion. First of all, this uh, consensus about the separation and primary functions of defense in the Argentina Republic, which is about preserving territorial integrity, defending our sovereignty, and having the, backup, the capacity to respond against any aggressive actions. So we, what's the consensus we were not able to achieve in the Argentinian Republic until, let's hope now, is the consensus on this uh, issue of equipment. Okay, basically, basically because of a uh, funding limitations in the Argentina Republic. There are other priorities and other needs which are always, which always marginalize the modernization for military equipment. Now, this is very important, okay, from the, from our point of view, why? Because when a military force is modernized, there were two different paths in the Argentina, which are precisely a product of the Falklands War. One, external reliance and the, all the problems brought by external reliance on military equipment. Remember that Argentina mostly got mil French military equipment and French military equipment, which was sanctioned. And once the Falklands War happened, and which uh, currently these sanctions, which are still in force, make it so the scope of uh, equipment which we can purchase is limited. So we are faced with very difficult political decisions. So this is a key element we have to think about. Uh, there is a stream of thought in the Argentinian Republic, which is about this idea of producing to modernize, to become competitive, but also to try and limit our external reliance. Of course, times are different now, and this proposal, interesting as it may be, also has some limitations. The other alternative is the alternative to go and buy from the market, but what's the problem there? Precisely about the limitations imposed by sanctions on market buys, which also have an impact on the capacity of the Argentinian Republic to increase it's uh, interoperability with um, regional center, regional military forces which are critical for our defense structure, for example, the South Atlantic, such as uh, Brazil, such as Chile. So this is important, okay, this is important to consider. The other discussion upon which 
we are we are now working and this is extremely positive this is a discussion about modernization okay so what which modernization the the war military forces the Argentina republic have come to address so on one hand if we are going to be keeping certain capabilities or if we are going to be incorporating some capabilities that expand our military the, the military projection and the force we can have okay for example it's not the same to be able to have a, for example, a replacement spare parts for planes that are needed for marine patrol to be able to add an anti-submarine warfare capabilities, which is something we should call to alert. For example, on a submarine deployments, which eventually may be contacted by the United Kingdom in the South Atlantic. So this discussion is something that we have to pay attention to as well in a context where disputes remain open. Okay, so this is uh, something important to be addressed. This uh, discussion of this consensus and this discussion lead me to a third point, which is uh, an important point in relation to how these uh, political dynamics interact in the Argentina Republic. Okay, so when Mr. Catrell identified that there are four groups that there, there have been four groups in these 40 years after the Falklands War. What we may call the renewers, the restorers, the revolutionaries, and, and there's the two first, the restorers and the revolutionaries. Understand, clearly understand that we have to modernize our armed forces. We have to start discussing and expanding these functions and scopes of the armed forces with a different, uh, two different degrees, uh, give them a greater volume in the Argentinian Republic when it comes to their institutional role and also the priority it has to have for the country. But then we have the more moderate or reluctant uh, groups that want to preserve the status quo in what has already been built from the original consensus, this consensus about the division between security and defense. So why is this important? Because this has a direct impact on our national defense uh, policy guidelines and also the decrees that guide the future of the military forces in the Argentina Republic. So what's important to know about this? that we have a decree, okay, a law decree, which was decree 726 from 2006, which was replaced by decree 683 from 2018. And what these two decrees show is indeed this correlation between what uh, was identified by these uh, struggling groups in the Argentina republics and to establish the future of defense. So where are we today? He, now we are in an element in this re -up, well, like updating of this uh, word decree 571 that basically reestablishes the primary function that military forces in Argentina have to be prepared to face an aggression, an external aggression, and a state actor. And this is something that leads us to a, a basic discussion, which is that Argentina doesn't have a, a hypothesis for the conflict and has replaced them with scenarios. But these scenarios, at the same time, are linked to state actors. So therefore, thinking about defense involves having these state actors right that may have an incidence on what, whichever scenarios may be relevant for the defense of the Argentina Republic. And here we have a discussion which uh, basically is related to who, who can have an impact on these uh, sovereignty scenarios for the Argentina Republic. In that scenario, okay, there is a discussion, at least in the classrooms, for example, and so on. If, if we don't have to start thinking about a sort of a design or a future force that is uh, since 2020 and onwards for the next 15 or 20 years, which is not directly related to these uh, corvette lines of uh, streams of thought, rather, rather the influence that some branches have on land-based scenarios. And this is something that we can take to our anti-access and the area denial strategies. And this is something really important because this discussion is going to be taken 
to this uh, to defense in the Argentina Republic in the next uh, few years. It's going to be guided by it. But the, there is also this new DPD and this new directorate on national defense policies has led us to think about a serious discussion, serious effective discussion on what kind of defense do we want or, or and also where are we going to be structuring these resources that are very scarce in the Argentina Republic, but which are still very important in defense first. Are we going to be emphasizing in this uh, previous defense or rather forward defense that is effectively reconstructing our Navy and our Air Forces? Or if we are going to have a more continental defense or what's called the rear defense, which is going to be mainly emphasizing these uh, terrestrial elements. This is an open discussion which we have to think about from this organizational point of view first and at the political level later. And this, of course, without changing our strategic position, the strategic position of the Argentina Republic that as established by law and also the political parameters that we follow remains defensive. To finalize um, in the interest of time, we have uh, recovered from our traumas and now we can have a much more effective discussion more closely aligned with this excellent point presented by Professor Friedman regarding the future of defense. And uh, this uh, discussion is going to be precisely linked to the strengths of the ideas held by these uh, groups that discuss on defense in the Argentine Republic. And we must keep in mind that defense is important in the Argentine Republic, but it's not going to be a priority in the near term that resources uh, we are going to have, as was mentioned in the, in the FONDEF, are those resources that we have available for us. But what's important is that we have a consensus that we have to spend in defense. That this uh, modernization, which we have to undertake what is now being discussed and is one of the most important internal discussions we must have. And finally, a personal thought regarding the future and especially thinking about how to collaborate and how to cooperate more. This uh, relationship between Argentina and Chile is extremely important in the present and the future. And I'd even say it's more important the relationship between Argentina and Great Britain. But in, a, in the near future, the way in which we define our relationship with Great Britain, this is also going to be defining our relationship with we have to have with Chile. Thank you so much to all of you for listening to me, and I hope I follow the established amount of time. Thank you so much. Last but not least, I would like to introduce uh, Admiral Matias Porcel, Professor of the Strategy Department of the Chilean Naval War Academy, and author of numerous maritime publications with the subject, the Chilean perception of the conflict and the main lesson learned. What was the impact on Chilean institutional and joint doctrine and strategy? Sir, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, John. Thank you so much, John. It's a privilege, it's an honor, and it's something to be proud about to present after such distinguished professors who have had the pleasure of reading, particularly Professor Friedman. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to present a view, which is a, a compliment to what they also mentioned before me, in such a way that this uh, seminar has approaches from different uh, analysis. Chile wasn't a, a, conf a conflicted party in this conflict, but it was a party to it. 40 years after the event, I think we can draw some lessons that can be valuable and which may be the last uh, classic armed conflict in military history before globalization, before the cyber came into being, hybrid warfare, the automation, and also a bit before there were, there were a consensus regarding the US reforms to migrate to a joint uh, structure for the defense of their, the various countries. And then I'll allow myself to propose some lessons learned from two different points of view regarding how this uh, conflict was politically guided in terms of strategy. And finally, some thoughts about the impacts of this uh, that this conflict um, also have 
not only for these uh, two parties, right, and for these two belligerent parties, and also for Chile, and also in terms of how we study this uh, conflict in different uh, academic con contexts the, around the world. From the political point of view, both states were facing a difficult uh, time at home when the conflict began. And that was the reality in Great Britain, and that was the case in Argentina as well. And this led it, so this crisis and then the subsequent war, where a sort of politic, uh, pop people's adherence to both causes in the respective countries. And this uh, people's pressure led it, so make, made it so the action of not doing anything were politically and physical for the United Kingdom. In the same way, this uh, large numbers of people in the mayor square, the withdrawal from the, the of this uh, withdrawing troops from the Falklands was not a politically viable option at the time for Argentina as well. So these political moments have relevant effects on how these events developed. And they are not always the intended or planned consequences. Maybe events were planned in one way, and this so-called uh, fog of war, and this uh, trinity from Clausewitz, right, where the role of the people plays a fundamental role, makes it so decision-making processes are particularly different, especially, especially when, from the political area, the value assigned to these objectives or these targets being disputed is importantly relevant. And it seems that in this appraisal of these uh, objectives, that's where the key for understanding why uh, side one and the other lost lies. There is a serious problem we can see in this analysis. A second point I'd like to highlight from the political point of view is this uh, value of the personality charisma and will of political leadership. And this is a relevant variable because when considering the, the equation of power of a state is the only variable that can bring all of this to zero, the lack of political will at a given point in time, the decision not to use national instruments in order to achieve the instruments uh, objectives that satisfy these uh, targets is the only variable that can bring the whole house, house of courts down. In both cases, Argentina and Great Britain, their political leaderships, attributes, and qualities play a critical role. It would have been totally different if there were other people at the helm. This is not about the institutionality, but rather it was the personal attributes of the people in charge. A third point I'd like to mention as well is the reason and synergistic articulation of the national instruments of power, which are a critical element in a conflict. It's not just about the strategic guidance of armed forces in a joint landscape, but also the capability to be able to articulate all these instruments of national power. The political nature of an armed conflict is made manifest in that capacity. And obtaining the best result from all these capacities that are available in the country in order to meet these objectives requires, requires a special skill and a special political guidance. In the British case, even though they were surprised by the Argentinian invasion, they were very able to quickly take the political measures in order to initiate the response processes to this challenge. And I'd like to highlight or emphasize what happened with Lord Carrington when he assumed political responsibilities because of what happened. And also Francis Tim, who began this uh, process during the entire diplomatic crisis and negotiation, but lasted until the Belgrano ship was sunk. And then it was his position was taken by, by John Nott as a defense secretary, which also shows a very special transition regarding how these uh, political areas of the conflict were articulated, articulated, sorry. And it also mentioned the importance of the way in which the political instruments of national powers were articulated, the sanctions that were imposed, particularly regarding this uh, French equipment, which uh, denied the Argentina access to exocet, right? And it was relevant and actually it made a, it made a critical impact on the results of the event. And the diplo diplomatic role, particularly in Great Britain, is about the swiftness in which they were able to obtain this United Nations resolution declaring Argentina as the aggressor and requesting the immediate withdrawal of their troops. And in that way, they were able to also 
activate the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance. And what's most important from my point of view, to keep the United States on, with uh, supporting Great Britain. I'll allow myself to address as a point of view that keeping the United States on Great Britain's side became the center of gravity, if you will, from English political maneuvering at one point, because without that support, the everything would, would have been totally different. Argentina, on the other hand, had a relevant flaws when articulating their national power. A, in their delay, for example, were notifying any operations to their political offices, their inability to achieve their goals reflected in the Rottenbach report, for example, and also a lack of foresight in their economic instruments, which uh, suffered a series of sanctions that were pretty harsh regarding embargoes and the uh, financial assets being frozen as well. On the other hand, from the point of view of political guidance in Great Britain, there was a political aspect for a war of limited scopes. And here I'd like to highlight something uh, about the strategic uh, thought on this part. This is uh, by the book, applying uh, Sir Julian Korn. That is, we have the tools, the academic and strategic thinking tools to develop something that was really developed following uh, the rules in the book. So therefore, this uh, British model did uh, have its basis in theory and also in application, both the research and also regarding the practice. And I have no doubts that uh, what Professor Friedman said regarding the experience on the political area, both from the Secretaries of Foreign Affairs and also Defense, there were experience was, of course, something really interesting in this regard. The Argentinian model was applied with a continental or terrestrial criteria based on the occupied Falklands territory, failing to understand the maritime nature of the conflict that they started, because in order to retain what they conquered, they needed to achieve a maritime superiority. And this figure, even though this is going to be analyzed in the next step, in the strategic analysis, from the political point of view, it required an emphasis and an adjustment, a refinement, if you will. The political reins now that uh, Prime Minister Thatcher used to lead the military were properly followed. And the, therefore, this uh, conflict was mainly confined to this assigned area of operation without having an impact on any other con objectives in the American continent. And the effectiveness was clearly proven in the way and the timing where they went over the critical aggression threshold when the continental submarine sank the Belgrano vessel. Now, this political guidance of the military instrument, the rules of engagement addressed, and also this uh, how this uh, was addressed did make a difference. The, the second point of view, which I'd like to mention is from the strategic area. Professor Friedman also mentioned this, and also our friend Juan as well. The command and control scheme used by the British Armed Forces was really special. But it was fruitful in a scenario where the operational reach, right, was uh, taken to its limits. In practice, the three commanders, uh, presenter, Admiral Woodward, Commander Clapp, and uh, Brigadier Thompson, became tactical parallel commanders with the field house admiral taking the operational command from this uh, operations theater. This allows the tactical commanders in the area to focus on operations, leaving, leaving other commanders to reinforce their strategic position to plan and execute a gigantic logistic effort to support their Navy, which was operating in the area, and also coordinate support for other joint forces that were present, both the special forces operating in the area, the submarines, and also, of course, uh, work at the planes that uh, made a significant contribution in the Falklands campaign. So the logistic British effort was impressive, as mentioned by Professor Friedman, and I couldn't agree more, not only because of the order of magnitude, but also for the response time. And even then, the loss of the Atlantic Bayer, 
caused such a logistical impact that was really close to turn this plan pl planning in a non-viable course of action. Here, Majesty Logistics, the person in charge of taking strategy and tactics to a more rooted approach. During conflict, both the areas operated to the limits of their logistic capabilities and both were really close to fail because of this, to failing, sorry. These uh, flaws, for example, in the strategic management in Argentina are clearly highlighted in the Rottenbach report. And of course, as uh, presented by Professor Batalieme, there has been a lot of discussion regarding how to reform, how to change, how to address the challenges that are coming in the future. In this area and in this environment, the amphibious projection capabilities of this projection of military terrestrial force from sea continues to have until now. And we can see this sort of from the amphibious, for example, capabilities in the Black Sea held by Russia in the Ukrainian conflict has a very important effect in order to deliberately choose where and when to focus an expeditionary force, forcing the adversary to understand and uh, rethink his lines of def defense because they cannot be present at all times. And with this, I'd like to start reflecting on the conflict in a more general view. And I'd like to address some comments in this regard. So the abandonment in terms of a search and of intelligence is something that is paid dearly, was paid dearly then and is paid dearly now. Whatever there are in the objective, it's fundamental to the lost intelligence offers that allow the establishment of strategic alerts and warnings that allow an adequate response time, reaction time, be for anyone who at any specific point in time has a different objectives. The Falklands War is a clear example of the pernicious effect of this permanent temptation of political management to address internal problems with external crises and conflicts. On the other hand, the apparent uh, savings when it comes to investing in defense by re reducing the British fleet and its capabilities ended up leading to an immense additional cost for the United Kingdom. Remember, it's it's going to be expensive if you try to be cheap when it comes to security and defense. Professional armed forces versus conscription. Argentina already made their decisions. Let's see what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine as well. This uh, Klausowitz Trinity is reflected even more when an important part of these uh, armies come from society, from civil society, from conscription. In this uh, con conscripts, right, society is made manifest and is present, represented. But nevertheless, the same society has increasingly less tolerance to casualties, injuries, mutilations, and the effects of war in conscripts. The behavior of the 21st century society makes it even more difficult and less likely for there to be conscripted forces. Chile, as I mentioned before, was not a vigilant party, but it did play a role, and it couldn't be any other way. Chapter 27 of uh, the work of Professor Friedman details the participation Chile had in this. And then the, this is speech by President Nigeria on April 2nd, uh, 1982. And then, of course, if a uh, this uh, military experience in the Falklands had been successful, Chile was next. We cannot forget that after January 25, 1978, after this uh, declaration by, because of this uh, Rhine conflict, Rhine conflict, sorry, it generated a mistrust, which we could only start reversing after this immense sacrifice made in maritime spaces in the southernmost seas that Chile had to make when they signed the Peace and Friendship Treaty from 1984 to achieve a peace. And then we started embarking on this path led us, that led us until today where we have open cooperation, important exchange. And I'd like to highlight something that is not well known by the end of the 20th century, early 21st century, India's Martal Kawano shipyards, destroyer Hercules, was a subject to a modernization and re repair process. 
In the same manner, Chile also realized the precariousness and the importance of its naval power in the southern area, which is an eminently maritime area. And it went through a process of modernizing its fleet, going from North American vessels from the Second World War to purchasing European vessels. But even more important than that, starting from 1984, this uh, reform project for our fleet, the training factor became a really relevant point. And nowadays, the increase of training and training standards for the Chilean army validated by flag officers and training and also by our Dutch friends are now one of its main assets. Finally, and to finalize my presentation, if we think that the Falklands uh, conflict can be summarized on a dispute for the sovereignty of an island close to a continent reclaimed by a regional power, which is uh, defended by a global power, which is yet far away from the islands, if we were to reduce the Falklands conflict to this view, then I'm sure the strategists and students and work colleges in China would be really looking at uh, what happens in the Falklands, precisely thinking about Taiwan. I rest my case, dear John, and I think we are now open for any questions and answers. Thank you very much for the presentation. We have uh, some time to, to do some questions that we have received here. Uh, one of them is related to what, what was the tipping point of this world for the UK and for the Argentinian? And uh, how, in your opinion, was the main impact of this tipping point in the final result of the world? We would like to, to hear Professor Friedman and Professor Bataleme in this order. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm not sure there was a single tipping point because these conflicts go through stages and at each stage um, there's a new challenge. Um, the problem for the British was once they'd sent the task force off, uh, either there had to be a negotiated agreement or they had to keep on going. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that the Hague um, uh, mediation failed in, in April and then Paris de Quay's mediation failed in May, um, meant that at each stage you, you then had to go to the next military moment. Um, I think the, the key thing for the UK, I mean, there were two key things. First were the events of 1st and May, 1st and 2nd of May, 1982, including the sinking of the Belgrano, um, because I think that brought home the seriousness of the war. Um, and probably um, uh, had more of a military impact than we realized at the time because of the effect on the Argentine Navy. But I think for the UK, it was really getting through the landings at San Carlos and losing ships, but still managing to get the, um, the force ashore that could then move on to the next stage of um, of moving to, to taking Goose Green and, and moving to the island, um, despite the difficulties caused by the loss of the Atlantic Convair. I think once the UK was confident that it had its forces in place on the island, uh, it expected to win. And you can see this in the attitude to negotiations where British lost all interest in, uh, in in any attempt at mediation, vetoed the Security Council sort of ceasefire resolution and and so on. I, I think so. I think you could say that was the point at which <coughs> the UK was really confident that it could prevail. But I don't think it was wholly confident until that moment. Thank you, sir. Let me. Uh, pardon. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. Professor um, Freeman, let me, déjenme terminar de... de and allow me to 
present is from the Argentinian Republic's point of view. There is an excellent book. There are two excellent books. One, which is about the Argentinian's reply precisely to this official history, which is the book by a, by a diplomat in the Argentine Republic, which is Vicente, excellent book. And also a very good book from which is called the 1982 not from a diplomat, but rather from a political educator. I think the key point, which once again, there is not a single key point, but I think the main big point is this uh, final or last conversation between Ronald Reagan and Neri. When Ronald Reagan tells him no, that this uh, force already been detected, that invading was going to be an atrocious mistake, and that this was going to be something rigid, which uh, was still in a context of a, in a constant flowing dynamic context and once the military actions were taken not only the us was not going to be on the side of the argentinian republic there was not going to be room for that but that also everything that had been achieved in terms of bilateral relations between the united kingdom and the argentinian republic was going to be lost i think once the fleet set sail and once the radio silence order was given, we crossed the Rubicon. And this Rubicon then became this landing, as mentioned by Professor Friedman. Okay, thank you, Juan. Oh. We're running out of time, but we do have for a last question, time for a last question for each of one. Um, here we have a, a question from, from Carlos. How do you see the current geopolitical competence over the Antarctica uh, from the British, Argentina, and Chilean point of view that could affect the status quo over the South Atlantic in the years ahead? In the same order. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got, I mean, a lot to say on that. The, um, uh, I, I'm, one of the issues, obviously, has been what this means for uh, the overall position in Antarctica. Um, I don't think the British see themselves in a fight for Antarctica. Um, I think in many respects, um, which would be a view generally, if we could solve, uh, if we could put the sovereignty issue to one side, there's lots to be said for working with local countries, um, including Argentina and Chile, um, uh, to ensure that Antarctica is looked after and exploited properly and, and so on. Um, I think the, the British are, are distracted at the moment by, by Ukraine, but more generally by China and the Indo-Pacific, um, and don't have the same sort of um, ability to think to think globally uh, 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 as maybe they want they once did so I don't think there's the same sort of attention being given to the matter but um, I mean just more generally or uh, you know I think my view I'll give my view rather than the British view um, I mean my, my view is uh, and this whole, whole episode was an enormous shame uh, and that um, uh, but the both sides now are invested in their positions on, on the on the status of, of the islands. If there was a way of putting that to one side, there's an awful, awful lot of things that they could and should work together on. Um, uh, I think militarily, the British are reasonably confident that um, with the garrison there and the airport there, they're not going to be caught in the same way they were in, in 1982, and uh, they could reinforce quite quickly. There are regular speculations about whether that's still <laughs> the case, uh, but I suspect uh, it's sufficiently the case that if I was in Buenos Aires, I, I would not be tempted to test it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, Quite clear, and, and I'm completely agree with you in, <laughs> in your final sentence. Um, me, uh, Let me or allow me to reflect on that. First, I have a. There are two colleagues in the audience who I really respect, and I've read them 
for example, such as Silvia Venegas, a diplomat ambassador. And precisely, they say they are talent because they allow us from carry to think, no, no, or rather about not making these mistakes. And that's why I'm saying, okay, to think about the entirety is to think about the relations between the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Chile, and Latin Republic. This is key. And this uh, gives us an incentive to learn from the past and avoid making the same mistakes that were made back then and they develop a constructive relationship between these uh, three parties. The three of us are part of the Arctic system. And the three of us have interests in the Antarctic system. And this is something that has to guide us and guide our attention. From, the, from a military point of view, and only as a thought exercise in the military area, Argentina must always be thinking and rebuild some sort of um, mechanism related to the Santa access access in Iowa. Why? Because uh, it's always good to be able to say no, as I said before, to be able to say no when it's necessary to say no. And I think this is a very good book by Professor Dan Grevy, which especially talks about the relevance of the Santa access and also the Nanjins area, and it uh, brings the Falklands War as uh, an example of that. In speculative points, it would be something really interesting to explore as part of a potential modernization. But what's the uh, most important four years after the Falklands War is to think about the future and think about that, for example, what's going to happen in this for these uh, three nations. And they are closely tied to the Arctic, uh, which was designed as a peace area. Sí, eh, partir de los yes, hechos. I'd like to start from the facts. These uh, three countries have a sovereignty claims, overlapping claims on the Antarctic. These uh, three countries that are represented here today are those who are closest to the Arctic. And these uh, three countries that are here today need to have operational capabilities to be present in the Arctic because we don't have territorial land continuity. Nobody can take a walk to the Arctic. So under uh, that point of view, which is uh, an important real politics, all paths are open for creativity, cooperation, complementing each other. We have a series of undergoing efforts, the Antarctic combined naval patrol with Argentina and so on. But it's a fact that there is a geopolitical race for the Antarctic and which has also been exacerbated by these uh, deadlines under which the Arctic Treaty has to be reviewed at a given point in time. So from my point of view, there is an open instance for creativity, for cooperation, for inventiveness, and also to, to effectively put these uh, instances into practice on this context. Thank you. Well, uh, we would like to finish this activity, this conference, uh, saying thank you very much to our speaker for their uh, outstanding presentation about this uh, uh, 40 years of the Falkland and Malvinas War. And also we would like to honor in this day, particularly to the British and Argentinian soldier fallen on this war uh, from our Chilean point of view. And um, to invite all of the people connected to Latina Lab to our next and future activities. Thank you very much, sir, and have a very nice day. Thank you very much to London, to Buenos Aires, and Valparaíso. Have a nice day. Muchas gracias. Bye.